Thank you. I think I'm allowed to take this off for this part, aren't I? Um, last time I stood here, um, or actually standing there when I was here um, about uh, three decades ago, I think there must have been 700 people uh, in the place baying uh, away at uh, one side uh, or the other. So it's pretty, uh, it's, it's, it's a great privilege to be back, but my word, it feels, um, it kind of feels as though I've driven the audience away. Only about one in ten of the people who would normally have come have bothered to turn out. And I'm grateful to you all for wanting to come, and thank you for signing up uh, for the event. Um, I thought what I'd do is, rather than, uh, we're going to get questions, I'm sure, from you uh, about the civil service and about careers in public service and some of the issues that we face. But to be honest, I felt rather than spending uh, the next sort of 15, 20 minutes or so talking to you about the last 30 years of my uh, career since I was essentially about your age and then entered public service when I joined the Foreign Office, served overseas, mostly in the Middle East and South Asia, came back, ran the Home Office and then to the jobs that uh, you just heard about. Because I, I, I thought I'd look ahead, because I was conscious that if I'd been sitting where you're sitting now and someone who was uh, three decades on had come to talk to you about how they'd started out, uh, they'd have been talking about the Suez Crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Vietnam War. And I probably wouldn't have felt, I know to you, you probably think I am from that era, but I probably wouldn't have felt that that was necessarily relevant to the future that I face and the, the uh, issues you're going to be dealing with. So I thought what I'd try and do instead was look ahead to uh, the middle part of this century. Uh, and by that stage, one of you, quite likely, will be standing here and there'll be another generation of students uh, sitting there, hopefully 700 and not 70. Uh, and what are the issues that you're likely to be dealing with, your generation is likely to be dealing with, uh, particularly if you go into public service over the next 30 years. So I'm going to talk about some of the trends, the shocks, um, and uh, 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 give you some sense, I think, of uh, the, the issues that governments um, uh, and the multilateral system will face. So what we know by the middle part of the century, by 2050, is the biggest trend of all is ab around uh, the environment and climate change. You, are, you will know this well. Uh, the global temperature has risen by uh, one degree since the uh, pre-industrial age. Most of the volatility in the weather has come in the second half of that one degree uh, in the last few decades. And even if we're able to achieve net zero uh, worldwide, by the middle part of the century, the temperature will continue to rise and there will continue to be uh, volatility in the weather. Likely by the end of the century, on current projections, temperature will be three plus degrees more than uh, it was in the pre-industrial age, so uh, probably another degree by the middle part of the century. Uh, and even if uh, we're able to achieve net zero, then uh, the temperature will still be two degrees higher than it was in the pre-industrial age and with considerably more volatility um, in the climate. For the UK, by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean the climate will be warmer. If the North Atlantic Drift, the Gulf Stream current is disrupted, and it, uh, that is a possibility, nobody really uh, knows for sure, we could end up with a much, more, a much colder climate. That is, our moderate climate is essentially driven by the sea uh, currents. Climate change isn't the only environmental issue. Next year, the UK will be chairing a big summit, COP26, uh, on climate change to try and achieve net zero but China will be chairing a summit on biodiversity, and biodiversity um, is another huge environmental issue for us. If we're to feed ourselves and maintain um, the environmental balance in the planet, then biodiversity is arguably as important as climate change. The sectors that are going to have to do most to achieve net zero, um, uh, the energy sector, industry, transport, housing, and so on, are also those that will have to adapt most to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to deal with the rising sea levels and the volatility that's going to come in the climate uh, as a result. So that is a huge uh, uh, investment and a huge transition for our economy and society. Second big, big trend is demographics. By 2050, every part of the world, except for sub-Saharan Africa, will have an ageing population. One of the biggest challenges for China, for example, is will, there be, will their population be old before they are... Uh, wealthy. Uh, and the UK will have the largest population in Western Europe. We won't have the largest economy, probably, but we will have the largest uh, population, exceeding the population of Germany uh, because of a higher birth rate, etc., by the middle part uh, of the century. And if you look at demographics and the intersection of that with climate change, and just think of the example uh, of sub-Saharan Africa, as, the, as climate means that the Sahara will spread south, 
if there are insufficient jobs, insufficient economic growth for the only part of the world which will have a significant young population in it, then we'll, we're likely to see significant migration flows north with economic, social and political consequences for the countries of North Africa and indeed for Europe. And it's in the intersection of these really big trends that, uh, uh, that some of the most profound opportunities but also risks arise. The fourth industrial revolution, the IR 4.0, the technological revolution, um, the technologies that are now being developed will be, u u will be ubiquitous by the middle part of the century. Every industrial revolution so far has involved automation, uh, and this one will too. But the big difference with this one is that white-collar jobs will be automated in the way that blue-collar jobs, industrial jobs, agricultural jobs have been automated in previous industrial revolutions. Uh, the rise of autonomous technology combined with AI, machine learning, and so on, uh, could well have profound consequences for urbanization. People will, as we've learned through COVID, people do not need to be in cities in order to be able to work effectively. And so we may well see profound changes in the uh, geographical distribution, the economic geography uh, of our countries, as well as in the nature of work. Um, work uh, uh, EQ and creativity will be as much as a premium as IQ in the jobs of the next 25 years. Fourth is the shift in the uh, global centre of gravity from the North Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, the rise of China, notably, but not just China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, etc., um, are all going to be the fastest growing economies in the world, probably, over the next 25 years. Uh, and that, uh, as we're already seeing, will have profound geopolitical consequences. And finally, in competition and conflict between states, that is already becoming multi-domain um, and will undoubtedly do so over the next 25 years. So national security will not be just about the defense of the realm and keeping people safe from terrorism and crime. It'll be about economic security, health security, democratic security under challenges from countries and groups um, who will operate not just in the traditional land, sea and air, the traditional three domains, but in space, in cyberspace and in the information space. All of that is baked in. The people who are going to be your age um, in 2050 are going to be born in the next decade and their families uh, are already uh, forming. So those things we know. There will be climate change, there will be environmental impact, there will be huge demographic change, the technological revolution uh, will be baked in, there will be this shift to the Pacific and there will be multi-domain competition. But also we must assume over the next 30 years that we will face as many unpredictable shocks as we faced over uh, my uh, career since I left uh, this university. Um, the year I left, 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. We had the dot-com bubble in the 1990s. 9-11, the 2008 crash, the great tsunami, um, the Arab Spring, the referenda of 2014 and 2016 in this country, and of course, notably, COVID-19, the, the full consequences of which we haven't yet seen. We've had the health crisis, of course, and we're still working our way through that. We've had the economic impact of that. There will be, there always have been with pandemics and economic crises, a political and geopolitical impact. And we don't really know what all of that is going to be yet, but it will arise. One thing we do know is that it has sharpened and deepened the rivalry between the United States and China, and that relationship will be a dominant feature of um, uh, the, the global scene over the next 30 years. We'll determine uh, whether or not we crack these environmental questions, it'll determine global security, it'll determine the course of the world uh, economy. There will likely be further natural climate um, uh, and other shocks. Um, it, the, the public health issue that's arisen from COVID is essentially a natural phenomenon. There are likely to be climate shocks of some kind. We saw the great tsunami in the last 10 years. They were, there are likely to be, uh, to be others. And there's likely to be political shocks um, as well. Um, I've mentioned already the US and China, but if we look at uh, Russia, for example, that is a state um, that has a very strong but very, very brittle political system. Um, and uh, 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 we worry about the strength and assertiveness of Russia now. We might well be worrying about its coherence and unity over the next 25 years. I've already mentioned the, Im the, dem the impact of demographics and climate together uh, uh, with the young population in sub-Saharan Africa. And all Western economies that have now increased government expenditure by unprecedented pr proportions, uh, so that our debt to GDP ratio, public debt to GDP ratio is now essentially over 
as it is in the United States, France, it's 200% in Japan, less in Germany. Um, that, that is uh, sustainable at the moment, but if there was an inflationary shock, for example, a trade war between the US and China, uh, then the cost of that debt would rise, uh, and that would be a dominant feature of the economy over the next uh, 30 years. And of course, we don't yet know whether the UK will still be in the same shape uh, in 2050. Um, uh, support for independence in Scotland uh, is clearly uh, on the rise, and that is a challenge to the integrity of the UK. And then there are things that are just unknown. Uh, quantum computing and fusion could utterly transform uh, the nature of uh, economies um, uh, 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 and indeed of, the, of uh, government systems. Almost entirely in positive ways, by the way. We shouldn't think of these things as all risks. Shocks are not all bad, uh, but they just do disrupt uh, systems. And so I've indicated uh, some that might happen. Um, uh, uh, most likely, it'll be something I haven't mentioned and none, no one has really thought of yet. What does that mean for the UK? Well, the UK um, uh, needs to, will, will need to address over the next 30 years many of the issues that we've been seeking to address already. We have a productivity gap. Um, uh, the UK economy is less productive per, per head than our main competitors. We will need to invest in infrastructure and tech and uh, skills. We have, we're going to be dealing with the debt um, uh, for much of the next uh, 25 uh, years and of course we'll be dealing with a rising population and a population that although aging is going to be younger than most of our natural competitors and partners uh, in the Western world and there are opportunities for us uh, in that. Internationally uh, uh, I, all of this is still in play. It is possible that the world will drift towards protectionism uh, and friction and even uh, confrontation. I hope not, but, uh, but uh, it cannot be ruled out. And certainly the trend uh, is towards a more hostile and rivalrous relationship in particular between the US and China, and left unaddressed, that is bound uh, to deepen. But we do have choices. We can address these things, and the UK and other countries like the UK can play a role internationally in doing so. And so if I can identify just a few things that I think uh, we might uh, uh, focus on over the next few years that would um, uh, uh, put us onto a, a more positive course and mean that the, 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 the world uh, uh, is able to deal with some of these challenges in better shape to do so, having frankly not dealt uh, 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 very well with the COVID crisis, the reaction internationally has been fragmented. First, the global rule of law. We have to restore a sense that countries, however they organise themselves internally, uh, will respect the rule of law externally in their dealings with each other. Second, we are going to need a different economic settlement. Uh, we dealt over 150 years ago, particularly in the United States, with the uh, consequences of essentially unfettered um, uh, market conditions, unfettered capitalism with the rise of monopolies like Standard Oil and so on. We're seeing similar monopolistic um, uh, uh, phenomena arising in the world economy today behind uh, uh, the uh, barriers of protected economies. There, there, is there are going to have to be some revisions to the world uh, economic uh, settlement, uh, just as there were nationally uh, in the last century. And I hope that we can restore some sense of uh, unity of effort, unity of purpose among uh, the democratic uh, nations, with NATO obviously at its core, but many other uh, nations too, because the world order, the multilateral system of the last 75 years since World War II, has suited uh, our interests very well. It's been good for the world. It's led to um, unprecedented reductions in poverty, um, improvements in governance, um, uh, uh, improvements in uh, prosperity uh, and peace worldwide, uh, and we have a responsibility to try and ensure that is the story of the next 75 years, uh, notwithstanding the challenges and notwithstanding the problems we've had in the last 75, as it is, as it has been uh, for the last. And I hope this country, uh, under the leadership of this generation, because it'll be you or one of you who's standing here looking back on that 30 years and asking yourselves whether you left the world in, in a better shape and the country in a better shape uh, than it was when you embarked upon that journey and left the university and started to shape uh, the events. It'll be your generation that will determine these things, um, and I look forward to seeing uh, how you get on. I'm sure, given your commitments to more inclusive society, to looking after uh, the most vulnerable within our own societies, to tackling climate change, uh, to uh, all of the issues that are clearly dominant among your generation that we leave the world in capable hands. So good luck to you um, from all of us. Thank you.
So I thought we'd start off by discussing your particular position and then moving on to some questions about the civil service, the future of the country, the future of the world, the big ideas that you discussed in your opening speech. So, when you stood down as Cabinet Secretary and National Security Advisor this summer, you became the most high profile of three very prominent civil servants to leave their roles under the Johnson government. We all saw the press about it. So I guess my opening question is fundamentally, why do so many senior civil servants not feel able to serve this government? I don't think that's the case. Um, you would normally expect a significant number of people to leave these, these top jobs, people who are towards the end of their careers, in the first year of a new parliament. Actually, if you look at the data, the numbers are slightly lower than have been the case in, uh, in previous parliaments. So there's a lot of you know, press noise around this. Uh, but but um, to be honest, that isn't, it, isn't, uh, it isn't the case. And civil servants um, have absolutely in our professional DNA that we serve the governments our fellow citizens elect. Uh, uh, and we help implement the programmes that those citizens have voted for. And we put aside our own political opinions in order uh, to do so. And if you can't do that, you have to choose a different career. Uh, uh, so um, uh, the civil service, is, civil service is continuing and, and all of those people continue to fulfil their professional duty to serve this government just as they've served previous governments of different political complexions. How do you think the government's very prominent civil service reforms are affecting that ability? Well, I'm in favour of civil service reform. Um, and I don't know whether any of you watched it, but I gave quite a long speech, quite a long lecture at the Blavatnik School back in July, shortly after uh, uh, I announced my, uh, my, my um, retirement, um, uh, and mo much of it was about civil service reform. Now, actually, it was about government reform, and that's the key to this. It isn't just reform of the civil service. Politicians often talk about reform of the civil service. Civil servants often talk about reform of the government as a whole. And I think there are big changes we need to ensure modern government is um, fit to deal with those kind of challenges that I just set out. Our governmental structures would be recognisable. You and I were just talking in the Gladstone room here. Well, our governmental structures would be recognisable to Gladstone. Indeed, many of them were developed by him, and some should remain. The underlying principle should remain. But um, uh, we do need to modernise government, and civil service reform is part of that. Is there not something of a difference between modernising government and bringing the civil service into the 21st century and you know, creating quite a rift between an independent civil service and a government which is briefing against it and in which there's so much press discussion about whether people feel able to serve it. It's not as if these reforms haven't been political ones. No, there, there is. Look, this is politicised, and I, um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I've been I mean, very clear. I condemn briefing, particularly anonymous briefing, whether it's against individuals or uh, institutions. If you want to make an argument, make an argument. You know, come here, set it out. Um, put yourself uh, in the frame and be ready for people to criticise it. Don't you know, go uh, briefing against people behind their back, and particularly people who can't answer back. It isn't just the civil service who face that, by the way. Um, I think the worst episode of this was when we saw a group of very senior judges described as enemies of the people, for example. That was a much worse instance uh, 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 of this, and that wasn't um, uh, as a result of politicians, and it was before this particular administration uh, was in place. And also, you see briefing between politicians and between ministers against each other, and we've seen that in previous governments as well. All of that is just bad for good governance. Uh, good governance requires, you know, is a team sport, the issues are hard, they are contentious, those arguments should be held in the open. So could, had you, you know, not decided to leave at the time you did, do you think you would have been able to remain and see the introduction of the reform, kind of reforms we're seeing now? Certainly, yeah, certainly had I, had I chosen to stay on, then that would have been a big part of the agenda that I would have, uh, would have pursued and indeed um, uh, had discussed many of the things that I set out in that Blavatnik lecture with the PM and, uh, uh, and, his, uh, and his team. And I'm confident that we, that, that, um, that, uh, that, that will be pursued you know, even though I'm no, no longer there. It doesn't, didn't depend on me. So I suppose regardless of your reasons for leaving, evidently with so much turnover at the top of the civil service at the moment, this leaves a lot of room for new people, new faces, and often very political ones. Do, when you see things like the appointment of your success, successor as National Security Advisor, David Frost, very political appointments, when you see those, do they worry you? Are you concerned for the impartiality of the civil service going forwards? I think I, think I would worry if we had political appointees into the civil service. That would be different. That would be a major change. But choosing to have a political appointee as the National Security Advisor, which is a fairly unique job in any event, and a guy who's a 
former diplomat, I mean, he's a, you know, he, he and I are contemporaries, I've known him for 25 years. Um, I don't think we should see that as you know, a, major, uh, a, a major shift change. My successor as cabinet secretary is a rising star, you know, civil, or now a risen star, um, uh, civil servant. He's reached the top of the civil service at, the, you know, at, a, at a relatively uh, young age and is a professional and highly committed civil servant. One of the things I was proudest of was the promotion of more women into these top jobs in my time uh, as cabinet secretary to try and achieve a better balance in the leadership of the, uh, of the civil service, notwithstanding the fact there's a long way uh, to go. And one of the permanent secretaries you referred to as having, uh, uh, who, who has, has stood down over the past a few months has been replaced um, already by a, uh, a, female, um, a female colleague. So you know, changes, changes in the nature of it and change enables us to bring new, younger talent on, like my successor as cabinet secretary, like some of the other permanent secretaries I appointed. Fantastic. So I suppose zooming out a bit to look at your role just before you left, obviously at the height of handling the pandemic, which we're all still experiencing, do you think that you were successful in your response in the time you ever saw it? Um, well, of course, in a sense, I didn't. I mean, there's that famous exchange, which actually where we were joking, but about who was, who was, um, uh, 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 who was doing that. Um, uh, I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, that's what the inquiry will address, and, we, and it will have to determine whether we, got the, whether we took the right decisions at the right time. And fundamentally, that'll be about the really big questions. Was the nature of the lockdown right? Did it come early enough? Um, was the communication coherent and, and so on? Um, it was extraordinarily difficult to deal with. Um, and actually, inevitably, the, the press and, uh, 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 and, and you know, the, the political debate focuses on the things that didn't go well. But we need to remember the things that did go well. You know, no one in this country failed to get the medical treatment they needed. That was not the case in every other country in Western Europe. You will recall pictures in the spring of people dying uh, on beds in hospital corridors in other European countries, and we were absolutely determined to make sure that wasn't the case here. Everyone who needed a ventilator, everyone who needed drugs, everyone who needed medical treatment got exactly the medical treatment they needed. And that was not a foregone conclusion for a pandemic uh, on this scale. It took action uh, to, uh, to, to um, intervention uh, to, uh, to deliver that. Um, at the height of the lockdown, as we were uh, it's actually when the Prime Minister was still uh, himself uh, 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 off sick. At the height of the lockdown, we planned the phased route out of it over the next uh, couple of months and planned what the COVID secure economy and society would be like and then we're able to implement those plans in a phased and safe, uh, uh, and safe way. Um, so, you know, of course, we've got to learn lessons and, of course, you, you, we, we've had, what, 45,000... Uh, uh, people have died before their time and no one must underestimate the impact of that and we've got to look very hard at ourselves and ask did we do the right things at the right time was the system fit for purpose did we take the right decisions but nor must we neglect the immense efforts of public servants including politicians to to get this right and uh, and and the things that did go well in this country um, uh, compared, for example, to, to others, not least some of the very imaginative e uh, economic schemes and so on. Was there a point at the height of the pandemic when there was a real sense that things might not turn out as they have now, whether you know, good or bad, that things might have been really terrible? Was there a major turning point that you can recall? Um, I think the, the... I mean, it was clear that the worst-case scenarios were significantly worse than, than what we've seen so far. Now, of course, we aren't at the end of this yet, so we don't know. Uh, but the worst case scenarios were significantly worse, and we've seen some of that uh, elsewhere, including, for example, people not getting the treatment that they needed. And so we were always worried about that, and we were always planning and um, uh, putting in place programs against those, against those risks. So one of the criticisms we've had is were the Nightingale hospitals necessary? Because actually, they were underused in that sense. You, you, you'll have seen pictures of them set up at breakneck pace, faster than China did theirs, by the way. Um, set up at breakneck pace with uh, civil servants, uh, medics, the army, and, and so on working together. And in the end, they weren't, it wasn't necessary. They weren't, they, they were, they, we had a capacity we didn't use. So people said, well, was it really necessary? Did you need to spend that money on that? Did you need to invest resources in it? Did you need to do all of that? Well, just imagine what we'd done, what it, we would have felt if we hadn't had that capacity and the NHS hadn't been able to cope. So um, 
we were constantly asking ourselves, how do we make sure we have enough capability and enough capacity to deal with, uh, to, to, to deal with the situation we face? Now, not, you know, of course not everything's gone well. You know, the uh, test track trace program is, uh, uh, you know, is months later than we wanted um, and it is still having some, uh, it's still some, having some issues, yeah, et cetera. Of course that is the case. But um, I think we were right to throw all the effort at, at all the things we did. Where do you see us going next in terms of whether you know, lockdowns are sustainable solutions long term, in terms of what might happen over the winter? Obviously, you're no longer in government. It's not your job to propose um, policy solutions. But do you think that there, you know, we are coming out of the woods somewhat, or do you think that we're going back to a point that we saw in spring? I don't think we're going back to where we were in the spring, and I think um, the Prime Minister was asked about this in uh, interviews over the last, uh, over the last few days. Um, uh, 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 I mean, winter is going to be challenging, and it always was going to be challenging. Viruses of this kind spread um, more readily in enclosed spaces when the weather's damp, when people are confined, than they do in warm, dry weather, and of course we were lucky to have a, 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 dry, a warm, dry late spring and summer, and when people are, are outside. It, it transmits much less readily outside than it does inside, for example. And people tend to be more naturally spaced outside than they would be uh, inside. So autumn and winter were always going to be challenging. Um, people, uh, and and there, will, there will also be questions uh, about uh, a lot of false positives in that people will have other illnesses as they do in the autumn and winter. Many of those illnesses will present symptoms that uh, at least individuals won't be able to necessarily distinguish from COVID and therefore there'll be pressure on the NHS both from those illnesses and from the fear that those illnesses are actually COVID even when they, even when they aren't. So it's a, it, autumn and winter with a virus of this kind are always going to be complex and challenging but we understand the virus much better. I mean the, 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 the medical science around the virus is, is better developed. Uh, treatments are certainly much more advanced than they were um, uh, than they were in the spring. We have much better data than we did in the spring. And therefore, I hope, and I think it should be the case, that it will be possible to maintain, uh, even though it'll probably intensify, this differentiated approach where lockdowns are local, can be um, imposed and lifted at different places in different parts uh, uh, of the country. But in the end, we can't rule anything out because we haven't yet been through a winter with this virus and we'll have to see what happens. The pandemic has obviously brought the civil service into the public eye in a huge way and we've seen government or what seem to be political decisions often attributed to impartial ones, civil service ones, scientists' decisions, etc. Do you think that that's damaged the independence, the future role of the civil service? Do you think there's something that needs to be recovered from there or do you think it's an inevitable part of dealing with a national crisis? I think everyone is under the spotlight in a crisis of this kind and frankly it's right that they should be. Um, you know, it can't be the case that because the civil service is neutral and impartial or because the scientists are, um, uh, 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 are expert that they don't face scrutiny when we're dealing with something on this scale when uh, it's important that people understand the reasons that decisions were taken um, and the evidence on which they were taken and then how well they were implemented. All of those things are absolutely legitimate questions and of course will doubtless be the subject of the inquiry uh, when it comes. In the end, fundamentally though, you know, the, the, the big decisions have to be taken by elected ministers. We can advise, um, uh, 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 the scientists can advise, they can provide the evidence. We advise on the practicality implementation of programmes, of course on the economic impact and so on. And they have to balance these things uh, uh, off and that's, that's their job as elected uh, as elected politicians and you know, although um, there's been a lot of language around following the science, following the experts and so on, actually in the end the big decisions have all been taken by ministers, they've had to balance off the economic and public health consequences against, uh, against each other and the short and the long term and so on um, and that, you know, that, that's the way it has to work in a democratic system. Um, so to move on to another issue which has brought the civil service into public eye, Brexit, um, do you think that this has changed the relationship between civil service and government? Do you think that that's another thing that will affect its standing going forward? I think um, uh, anything like Brexit, and if you, you, you could, you could you, you, there's a similar phenomenon I think happened after the 2014 referendum in Scotland. Um, issues that are fundamentally about national identity, if you like, 
and so on are polarizing politically. Um, it isn't, you, the, the debate tends, whether it's Brexit or independence, for example, those, those debates don't just tend to be, uh, they aren't calibrated in the way that do you favor more state intervention, lower taxes, um, a publicly funded healthcare system or insurances, or all of these other issues, which tend to be quite complex, quite diffuse, and people can have a range of, of, of views along a spectrum, and generally don't, don't regard those as issues that put their views of their friends and family um, uh, at issue. So you, know, you and I could just completely disagree about the right economic uh, model for the country. It doesn't mean that we can't you know, be friends or, or family members or you know, good colleagues in, in other circumstances. Debates about national identity are polarizing and they're binary. You know, you're either pro-independence or against it, pro-Brexit or against it. And of course, there's a spectrum of views, hard, soft, etc. But fundamentally, in the end, you've got to go one way or the other. And that, that controversy and that polarization um, inevitably spills through the whole of public life. And it means that the civil service, but also, you know, I mentioned the judiciary um, earlier on, um, are seen at least partly through that lens. So, yeah, I'd like us to avoid that, and I'd like us to uh, be able to deal with these issues um, uh, in a way that takes the civil service back out of controversy and the public service as a whole, actually, not just the civil service, back out of, the, out of these sort of public controversies, um, the judiciary and others, uh, and others too. Um, uh, but I think, it is, I think it is inherent in the nature of uh, referendums that are about national identity, that, that issues that are that polarising, that some, it, it will change the basis on which um, uh, the public view uh, institutions as a whole. How do you think you go about repairing that, especially when there's so little incentive for individual governments to? Well, actually, I mean, oddly, I don't, in a sense, think the relationship between the public and, and the public service needs repair. Um, if you actually look at the, the, the data, we do polling on this, um, the uh, uh, trust in, public trust in the civil service is the highest it's ever been. It's of something like 65, 66%, something like that. And civil servants are beginning to catch up with other public servants like nurses, doctors, uh, firefighters, police officers, and so on, in public confidence in them. So actually, the relationship between the citizen and the, and the civil service, I think, is in pretty robust shape. And that isn't because of anything people in Whitehall, in sort of jobs like the one I did, do. It's because people see their civil servants um, or other public servants delivering the services they need, behaving according to the values that we espouse, uh, operating with compassion, particularly to our, towards our most vulnerable citizens. And what we've seen in communities during the, during the pandemic is that those people have played a leadership role away from work in their own communities. Um, and, and have often been the people responsible for ensuring that the elderly have you know, been looked after and the food packages are going and if there are people who are vulnerable there's somebody who's at least picking up the phone to them even if they can't go and see them and so I think that underlying sense of um, community values that infuse the public service has given the you know, is, has helped citizens have confidence in it of course um, as I sometimes point out to them public confidence in politicians and journalists is somewhat lower. Um, you discussed during your brief talk at the beginning our sort of future place on the world stage how the United Kingdom what it can do in the future, moving beyond the pandemic, Brexit, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. um, how do we have the kind of place on the world stage that you envision following all of the sort of chaos we've seen recently, international criticism regarding handling of the pandemic, regarding Brexit, a loss of faith from other nations, and a sort of difficulty in finding our feet with regards to other countries? Where do we go from here? Well, I think we mustn't underestimate the, the inherent strengths of this country. And if you look at the media in any country, it tends to be focused inward, particularly during a crisis of this kind. Uh, it tends to be introspective and tends to pick up um, critical views from elsewhere. So look at the United States you know, right now and the nature of the political debate there. But if you look at France, you know, the French government, President Macron, who you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, came to power essentially as a, you know, as a virtually unknown figure, is under very severe political pressure because of the French government's response to, uh, to the pandemic. So we mustn't, when we focus on ourselves, we mustn't assume that this is the only country in which this, um, 
uh, yeah, the, 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 these challenges are being, are being faced. In the end, this country, having decided to leave the EU, um, needs to find a new uh, position for ourselves uh, uh, in the global uh, system. Uh, 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 and you know, that's something that isn't just the duty of an individual government. It's something that we'll have to settle over, uh, over a period. And we'll be friends and partners, I hope, and allies of our European uh, continental European neighbours will still be an ally of the United States, you know, etc. So, uh, and we mustn't underestimate our underlying you know, capabilities. It's still the fifth largest economy in the world. It's still the country um, you know, that, that attracts uh, more international students than any other country of its own size and scale, including you know, here, at, uh, here at Oxford. You know, there are reasons for that, that, that uh, and of course we have the benefit of the English language. There are reasons for that that we mustn't underestimate. So, you know, don't, you know, your generation you know, needs to be positive about you know, the, the role that you and this country under your leadership can play in the world because in the end, fundamentally, it's down to you. It's down to whether we are uh, uh, confident and thoughtful uh, and smart uh, in the way we operate. Uh, to look at a specific issue then, you talked about the climate crisis and, you know, gr our green future. Obviously, this is a problem that's much, much bigger than us as individuals, yeah. as the UK as a nation. We may be a large economy, but we are powerless in terms of the climate crisis compared to an international cooperation. So how do we go about building the types of you know, international alliances, business alliances, putting pressure on business to ensure that actually we do have a green future of the kind you described, rather than you know, being a small country talking about it with ultimately not that much power to make a difference on an international. Well, I think, the, in a sense, the answer to your question is the way is in the things you said and the answer in, 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 putting, in putting the question. We are uh, chairing this, this uh, COP26 conference, and therefore we have a leadership role. We need to frame that. Um, uh, uh, and, and, in, and, of course, in the presidency of the G7 that we have uh, at, the, at the same time. Part of this is about leading by example. So the, you know, we were the first major country to set the net zero by 2050 uh, target and to put it into legislation. Um, so uh, you know, there, there are many who feel that is not ambitious enough, but it was certainly ambitious at the time. It was more ambitious than uh, other countries. And by the way, it's going to require an immense investment um, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to achieve that and a huge reorientation of our economy uh, and society. So we can lead by example. Um, but part of this is in people-to-people -people contacts as well. It is the case that the younger generation worldwide are really preoccupied about this issue. The Greta Thunberg phenomenon is a genuinely global phenomenon. She's, she's the representative, really, of an entire generation that is really preoccupied with this. And if after COVID we're going to fulfill the commitment to build back better, we are going to have to build back green. Uh, uh, the, the people most affected by the economic crisis have been the younger generation. It's, it's the jobs um, that, uh, that, that people of your age are doing that have been, that have been uh, disproportionately affected by the economic impact. Obviously, the health impact has tended to affect uh, 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 others. And so you, you, any political system that's going to respond to the younger generation is going to have to respond to to climate change. But fundamentally, we have to persuade, ensure that China, the United States, India, the other really big countries, uh, the big emitters, are uh, responding to this. Actually, you've seen the Chinese have made a big commitment to this. They've got this biodiversity conference. Let's see if they deliver that commitment. But it is encouraging, they feel, you know, in, an, in a system that is, you know, let's say, slightly less politically responsive than ours to its citizens, um, in a system like that, they've made that commitment. Okay, with that, I think we will move to audience questions. They will look slightly different to what you might have experienced before. There'll be a member of committee with a boom mic, so if I pick you, they will come to you. Please keep your mask on while you ask the question so that the mic re remains sanitary. So, does anybody have any questions? Um, in the third row back. I was going to say in the mask, but that is everybody. Uh, hi, hello, my name is um, Cameron. I'm a French and Russian undergraduate at Christchurch. So Mark, hi, my Cameron. question to you is, um, do you feel that um, during your time in the civil service there were sufficient mechanisms for you to deal with friction between yourself as a civil servant and then the politicians that you serve? Did you have any of your own kind of 
uh, mechanism to try and deal with that, anything that you were able to implement to make your relationship with your essentially partner in, you know, in government to, yeah, essentially make this as fluid as possible? Um, thanks. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question, and it's, a, and it's an important one for any civil or, or, or public servant. I mean, fundamentally, it's about trust and respect. And so, you know, in the end, you know, okay, I've held some big jobs, I've got some grand titles, all the rest of it. No one elected me, and I'm not ordained. So, you know, I don't have a mandate. The, you know, the mandate is with the, is with the politicians and the ministers. They're the people who our citizens have elected, whether we you know, agree or disagree with their particular views. And we have to remember that. It, it is really important that uh, the civil service responds to the democratic mandate of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the governments, that governments have. And so in terms of the frictions, it's very rarely over policy issues because our job is to present the ministers with uh, the, the evidence, including the unwelcome evidence and the hard news and the bad news, uh, and you have to do that in a way, just as frankly you'd find in any institution, in a way that um, uh, maintains their confidence and trust and is respectful. You don't generally tell them they're talking rubbish in front of a, a large number of people. You might, in private, say, you got that completely, you, you do realise you said something there that you're going to have to retract or is a mistake and so on. But that's just, you know, frankly, if you were you know, working in, I don't know, the BBC or Barclays Bank or whatever, you know, I, I, you know any institution, you try and maintain human relationships um, where, frankly, you do bad news in private and praise, um, uh, and praise in public. Uh, and so you know, part of the job, and, and, and really good civil servants do this, is to demonstrate to ministers that we are going to help them deliver our agenda. We're completely committed to doing so, even if we were working for a government of a different political complexion only a few days before and de delivering a different agenda, that we will help them deliver theirs because they have that democratic mandate, that we will maintain their confidence and therefore not you know, um, breach their trust uh, uh, in, uh, in public and, in the end, fundamentally, help them deliver and... and do so. And I think that's how, in the end, you work through the frictions. They, they do come and go. Sometimes there are personality clashes. Sometimes you have to make changes. But fundamentally, uh, it's about establishing uh, the kind of relationship you need to make anything effective in any institution, which is trust, confidence, respect. Thank you very much. Do we have any further questions? Just on the front row, please. Hi, thank you for your talk, that was fascinating. Uh, my name's Elizabeth. Um, I had a question, I was particularly interested when you were discussing the shift of global power from the West to the Pacific, and I wondered how you thought that would play out in terms of the functioning of bodies like the UN and NATO, and particularly the structure of the Security Council. And I suppose as a sort of tangent from that question, um, you've spoken a lot about the way our democracy functions, but also it you know, bringing in strands of isolationism. And I was sort of wondering, tangentially to that, um, do you think that we are transgressing into perhaps a period that's the decline of liberal democracy and these um, global structures where diplomacy has been possible? Thanks. There's a whole PhD thesis in answering that question. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, I, so I think global governance will have to be reformed. I mean, it is clear that if we're to ensure that uh, countries that are becoming more important, more important economically, politically, and so on, um, yeah, that, that they feel that the system represents their interests and views and isn't simply imposed upon them by the countries that essentially were in the dominant position in the immediate post-war uh, period. So there will have to be reforms to global governance. And actually, in some institutions, those have happened already. Otherwise, what we will tend to see is competing institutions established and the fragmentation of the multilateral system. And I think that is both damaging because, uh, because um, uh, it, it makes it harder for us to achieve these, these global goals that can only be global, notably the, notably the environmental ones. Um, but it's also uh, dangerous in that if you start to create rival camps, then um, you know, that way conflict and confrontation can, uh, can, uh, can arise. So there will have to be reforms, uh, and the question really is, can we accommodate those changes, that changing balance, um, and can we ensure that everyone 
um, plays by the rules. So at the same time as giving countries um, that are becoming more influential and more powerful more of a say, then there has to be, alongside that, a sense of expectation that they will abide by the rules and norms of the global system if they're going to have a, a, a bigger role in, in, uh, uh, in, in shaping it. Um, there is clearly a risk, we're seeing, we have seen this, um, uh, the whole Thucydides trap question. Uh, uh, I don't know whether many of you have read Graham Allison's book, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty good uh, review of some of the historical examples of how the incumbent to dominant power has dealt with the rising power um, over well, the past couple of thousand years since um, Athens and Sparta, if there are any classicists um, uh, 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 among you. And you can argue about when it's worked and when it hasn't worked. But it is clear that for the next 25 years, probably for the whole of your adult lives, certainly the whole of mine, the remainder of mine, the relationship between the US and China is going to be the dominant question about global security, the world economy, and indeed even the future of the planet, because we can't tackle the environmental questions unless the big two are engaged. And can they find a new equilibrium? Can they find a, a, a means of dealing with each other, which doesn't necessarily mean they're going to agree on, uh, on everything, and certainly doesn't mean their political systems are going to align any time soon, but that means that they can both play a positive role in, in dealing in particular with those global, those global challenges. I mean, we don't know is the short answer. Uh, and fundamentally, those decisions will be taken in Beijing and Washington. But as allies of the United States, with a positive relationship with China, countries like the UK, and there are others too, I think have a role to play in that. Thank you. Some further questions, just here in the second row. I'm sorry, sometimes it's difficult to catch your name, so I, I, I apologize if I slightly miss your name when answering your question. Hi, I just wanted to thank you very much for the talk, first of all. Um, I'm just starting my degree in history and politics, and my question is very simple. Um, I noticed that during your talk, you were talking a lot about our generation and the problems that we're going to have to face. So I wanted to know if you had any tips or advice for those who are interested in a career in the civil service. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the, the, I suppose the key thing is, I mean, whatever you choose to do, whether you become a public servant, not just a civil servant, but a, a public servant, um, or whether you pursue a career in the private sector or the third sector, whatever it is, my strong urging to you is be engaged. One of the problems in our political system is the young don't vote enough. You all have very strong views on things. You'll go on protests and marches, but you don't always turn out at the ballot box. Turn out at the ballot box. Be engaged. In, you don't complain that the system doesn't reflect your views if you, don't, you know, if, you don't, if you don't get engaged. So for all of you, whether you want to go into the civil service or not, be engaged citizens and engage in the political system and engage in our democracy and make sure it is responding to your, uh, responding to, 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 to your priorities. If you want to join the civil service, then, um, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the, I suppose the, the, the key point is identify the area that you're passionate about. Your know, life is, your know, working life is long. And, uh, you know, I loved my, uh, absolutely loved my time, particularly in the foreign office, because I just, the thing I was passionate about was not just traveling and seeing the world and getting to know, know it and have a, have a sort of influence on it, but it's really getting under the skin of other cultures that you can only do if you live and work in a country, not if you just backpack uh, through it. And so that was why I chose that particular uh, route uh, to go. There are people who are utterly passionate about in, um, poverty reduction and international development, and so they went into different. There are people who are really passionate about social policy um, and looking after the most vulnerable in our own uh, society. Uh, there, are, you know, there will be economists in the room who um, you would like to make a contribution in that side. So, so if, you know, assuming you get in and assuming you decide to pursue a career um, and recognise that you'll have to work for governments that will definitely make decisions you don't agree with because that's just life, um, identify the things you really care about um, that you want to make your mission and that you want to use to uh, improve the fortunes of the country or the lives of our fellow citizens and, and, um, and throw yourself wholeheartedly into it. I've never regretted it for a moment. Any further questions? Just in the back row down here, if you're still around. Um, 
And by the way, be a team player. If you're not a team player, then don't go into the public service. So be a team player. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much for uh, coming to speak to us today. I have a question about policy and specifically the response to COVID-19. So governments around the world, from Canada to the UK to South Africa, are proposing you know, historic amounts of spending right now. Is there a way that we can do this spending, which obviously you know, we need relief, but in a way that also looks towards the future and debt reduction, debt management, can we make it targeted? I mean, what is the best way to approach that while still being sensitive to debt? Um, it's a really big question, and of course, if you have the Chancellor of the Exchequer or the Treasury Secretary from the US or wherever sitting here, uh, they would probably tell you that is exactly the question they're wrestling with, and they don't have a straightforward answer to it. Um, I mean, in the end, if you need, uh, and we, do need, we will need to get the debt back down again, because you know, interest payments, for example, at the moment on debt running at around 100% of GDP is f about 50 billion pounds a year. Uh, and that is larger than the defence budget and exceeded only by the health, education and welfare budgets. If long-term interest rates, which are internationally set, not set by, you know, set by the markets, went up from 25 to 5%, for example, then that would, you know, that would then become one of the biggest line items in our budget. And the same is true in other countries uh, as well. And so it's not just the overall debt, it's can you service effectively the debt interest? And of course, you know, some developing economies have struggled with that, and that's why we've had debt forgiveness programs, but you can't do that um, for the advanced Western economies because we're the ones with the, uh, with the resources to, to deal with it. We can continue to do all sorts of creative things, as the Bank of England and as others have been doing, by um, buying the debt, central banks buying the debt, but that also has, uh, 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 it creates inflationary pressure. So it's fine when inflation is very low, as it is at the moment, and interest rates long-term interest rates are very low at the moment, but if there were an inflationary spike caused by a trade war or caused by um, some other event, it would be harder for them to do that as well. In the long term, there, is only, there are only really two ways of getting real debt down. One is you allow inflation to erode its real value, but inflation, as, we've, as we learned in the post-war period, has hugely damaging consequences for the real economy if you let it run at a level um, that's significant enough to reduce the real value of the vet of the debt by much, and so that isn't a route I think any responsible government is likely to take. Um, uh, uh, otherwise, you then have to grow your economy fast enough to generate the revenues, sufficient revenues, to create um, sustainable surpluses that can then bring the debt down uh, over time. So fundamentally, and that may well, by the way, Im involve in the short term allowing it to rise even further in order to put investment in the economy to try and put it onto higher growth path, and in the case of this country, address the productivity gap uh, between us, for example, between us and our main, uh, our main competitors. Uh, it is the case that uh, on average, at least in, um, uh, 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 in manufacturing, um, by Thursday evening, a German, French or American worker has produced the same as a British worker has produced by Friday evening. That isn't because our workers are less, you know, don't work as hard or anything like that. It's about capital investment, skills, R&D, really big structural questions that we need to address and we need to put our economy onto a higher growth path and only by putting it onto a higher growth path can we, uh, as a consequence of that, we will get wealthier, the economy grows faster, it's good for prosperity, but also it creates the revenues to bring down the debt. Thank you. We have time for one final question, um, just on the front row here. Yeah, since I picked on the, this fellow and said that we were friends, I, I, should let him, I should let him ask the last question. Hi, I'm Daniel. Thank you once again for a really, really interesting talk. So my question is about the civil service, which is what further steps do you think need to be taken to ensure that the civil service workforce are fully representative of the country as a whole? Um, it's, um, so it's, it's about uh, recruitment, um, and it's then about promotion and progression within the civil service. And part of that is, uh, I mean, actually what we tend to find is our recruitment processes, once people are into them, are genuinely promote diversity. Uh, if you actually look at the success rates on you know, when people get to shortlisting, longlisting stage and so on, as people go through the promotion process, for example, actually we're now pretty good at that um, overall and people have, do 
you know, we, we make a huge effort to give people a really fair chance and enable them to fulfill their, uh, fulfill their potential. Uh, there, is, there are definitely big challenges for us in encouraging people from all of our communities around the entire country. So looking at this not just through uh, a lens of different, um, different communities through sort of the ethnic uh, lens or through the religious lens, but actually also through the geographic and social lens uh, as well. Uh, and so you, uh, you know, part of the reason that the civil service is still not fully representative, though we're, mo we're more representative than most other big institutions, is partly because the graduate population isn't fully representative, and we have a disproportionate number of graduates in the kind of jobs that we, uh, that we do. Not, a, not in every grade, but, but uh, in some of them. So there are, there are societal issues uh, as well in order to enable us to reach out. But we do have programs that actually reach out to uh, communities that haven't traditionally thought of public service and you know, I've been involved in some of those myself where I've sat and chatted to a, you know, a group of a dozen young people pre-COVID pre lockdown obviously um, uh, it would be fewer now from you know, communities who wouldn't have thought of joining the civil service and who want to know whether it works for them or whether they'll have the opportunities uh, uh, and so on but fundamentally this is, this is a long campaign uh, it's, a, it's about giving people confidence that this is the right kind of institution for them uh, letting them know that they will be surrounded by people who will fully value every single person who's in the civil service um, and ensuring that we have the role models that people can aspire to, uh, aspire to follow. And if you, if you look at um, uh, different parts of the civil service, actually we have a pretty positive track record in some areas. So the Home Office, which I ran for four, uh, four and a half uh, years, was in Stonewall's um, uh, list of um, the most meritorious employers for over a decade that we we had really made an enormous effort to try and ensure that uh, uh, people felt the home office on the basis of sexuality that people felt the home office was a a great place to work and and were among colleagues who um, uh, uh, you, who enabled them to you know, to, 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 that their entire contribution was really properly valued and, and that we weren't just non-discriminatory, we were actively encouraging um, of, uh, re, uh, of including and valuing and representing people um, uh, uh, on grounds of sexuality, for example. We've got to do that in absolutely everything. We've got to be winning those awards in every single area because we've genuinely created the most... And I think it's less about... I mean, I've always said... It's not so much diversity and inclusion, it's about inclusion and diversity. You've got to create a truly inclusive culture and then the diversity um, uh, in your, in your uh, workforce will follow. Great, thank you so much. So, um, with that, please join me in thanking Sir Mark.